Hello, everyone. Are you feeling in the sunny day? <laughs> Great. So, welcome very much to Talks Challenging Boundaries. Uh, my name is Max, and this is Corbinian. We are the co founders of Moby Dick. And uh, we are very, very happy that you all came here. And um, challenging boundaries, what does that even mean? I think uh, the field of design and technology is actually shifting and creating an intersection. And uh, I think this platform here, or this talk panel, um, should focus on this intersection. And um, yeah, I think that's very important to think about that more, how our profession actually um, can generate something new also in a visual language. So we like this idea of, uh, of this platform, um, of being a platform. Um, and not a platform for yeah, like representing yourself. We understand it more as a platform for ex enhancing ex exchange. So we don't think about, um, about this, everything. You guys are here. We are a community here in Munich. And we think we should enhance this kind of community. We want to have an exchange in between arts, technology, design, and of course, people. So thank you, you guys are all here, and um, please give a warm welcome for Two Points Net, who's the first talk. So, um, hey, uh, welcome. We are Two Points, and that's a first screen. Two Points challenges boundaries. I don't know. I mean, that's what Moby Dick said. I mean, you will judge for yourself if we are challenging any boundaries. Hi, from me. I'm Martin from Two Points. But we are actually three of us. Uh, the other ones are Spanish. That's why I wrote this here in Spanish. Hola, or hola, which is Elio from Barcelona. And uh, Lupi, and Lupi and me started uh, Two Points in 2007, and now we are three. We are in Hamburg, and we are in Barcelona. Okay, so uh, which boundaries do we challenge? Um, I'm going to talk about one of the boundaries that we are challenging uh, nearly every day. Um, I don't mean like standing up earlier and bringing kids to school. I mean the, the logo thing. Um, if you know us, that's something that we made our fight, uh, the logo. And um, even though we are known for hating the logo, uh, clients still come to us and say, yeah, can you design us a logo? And then we say, uh, yes, of course, but we won't. And then we have to explain why. And that's uh, the tricky bit without sounding arrogant and saying, hi, we are designers and we know better than you. Um, no, we have to explain it why this is something that we don't do. Um, that's because uh, we have a contextual perception. We humans, not just we designers, everyone has a contextual perception, uh, which means that uh, the semantics, the meaning of uh, what you're communicating is changing according to you, of course, to your, the time uh, that you're in, the place that you're at. And depending on where you are and who you are, it's changing, of course, the meaning, but also uh, morphologically or formally. Um, the simplest uh, example is uh, websites. No, it, you have responsive websites since 2015. Google is penalizing all the non-responsive websites by not showing them um, on the first page when you search a subject. So. In this environment, if you design something like this, it can't be really efficient and effective. I didn't do this screen, I just took it from the internet. It says, your logo here, and um, I hope Drum Creative is not in the audience, but that's actually how uh, a lot of people understand uh, uh, how to make visual identities. So what we do is systems instead of logos flexible visual identities. The first project to explain you a little what this means is uh, Rethink Aldi. When we uh, posted this, a lot of people thought that we really de redesigned Aldi, and, uh, and they were starting to criticize Aldi and whatever. Actually, it's not about Aldi. It's, um, 
It was a commission from Icon Magazine in the UK, and they always ask different kinds of studios. Uh, like, for example, they ask as well architects like Rem Kohlhaas, but they are also studio build and different kinds of um, companies to reflect on a subject. And we took Aldi in this case. Um, you probably would have recognized this as well, right? Actually, there's no logo, but you still recognize Aldi. That's not from us, you know the bag, no? This, it was made by this artist, this German artist, Günther Frühtrunk. I would say even that this pattern got more famous than the actual logo. <laughs> so it's more about which, about the identification elements. Um, what do we need to make a company recognizable? And what we did when we got this assignment is we just made a grid, we redesigned the pattern, and out of the pattern we designed the logo. So it's the totally other way around than designing first the logo and then put it in every corner, your logo here. Um, but this is what conceptually this project actually is about. Um, I mean, I used it to explain you our process, how we work and uh, how we think, but it's actually about this. In, um, we studied in, uh, in the Netherlands, in, um, in The Hague. What we really liked about the Netherlands is, I don't know if you have this, seen the stamps that they produce in the Netherlands. This is like the, the stamps that they can use for uh, standing letters. And a lot of young de design studios, they're invited to design these stamps. This is something that does not happen in, um, in Germany. But what I liked about this is that it's such a simple, small thing, but it gets into, into contact with a lot of different kinds of people. And I think that's a huge uh, power that graphic design has, that we are in the streets and people see us and people even that don't go to galleries or to museums, they are getting in contact uh, with design. And um, I think big companies therefore also have a responsibility so that they, the things that they um, throw out in the street there, that they have more value than just selling more. And our idea was, in this, in this project, was why not use all the Aldi items and combine advertisement and art. But not just traditional paintings, but as well new photography. This is from a, um, a friend of ours, Monica Figueras. And we did this, like the left one would be then apple juice, the right one some mixed kind of fruit taste. The left one would be milk, the right one as well. Yeah, the, the image follows around, no? There's, uh, there's more than to the cow. Advertisement for asparagus, the uniform for the employees, the bags, paper bags, of course. So, um, how do we challenge boundaries? We work now for 15 years, almost uh, 20, but how you keep on challenging boundaries? And for us, a huge motivator um, has become this, the three columns in our work. Learn, we never stop learning, and in each project we try to experiment as well. We teach a lot as well. This helps us as well to talk about our ideas our, uh, with, the, with the students and then apply this in our work. Someone that has, really important, has been really important for us is Karl Gerstner. This thought of the, well, the... Um, flexible visual identities, or they're also called dynamic identities, or fluid identities, liquid identities. There's a lot of buzzwords around this, no? And uh, nearly everybody's pretending that it's something totally new. But actually, he did already in the 50s and 60s and 70s, he did a lot of um, flexible visual identities. And uh, I mean, this is one of them. There came a certain point that he said, actually, I don't need the logo anymore. It it's just became so stupid always to stick it in the, in the left upper corner. And um, I don't need it anymore to create identification or to create uh, recognition. So he developed systems which were recognizable, but they were also flexible and responsive. Here, I found this example as well interesting in the context of variable fonts. No? But it's actually really old school done. This is just a, like um, a set of different kinds of lines that he put together. Uh, to create this age, and then he can create lots of different shades of this age. Well, we were looking as well for how do we advance with our systems, and we were seeing 
um, we were trying to find material, books about um, flexible visual systems, and there's not much. And uh, we, he had this thing in his uh, book, it's the morphological box uh, from Fritz Zwicky, and Gerstner used this one to list, first of all, to list all the different kinds of possibilities that a design project could have. So you have to see this as well like a container, which you could adapt at any time with uh, modern uh, elements of design. And then he just chooses by random uh, different kinds of components of the system. I'm going to just explain for the ones that are sitting there, because maybe it's not readable from there. You have like, a, uh, he's talking, he's specifying in this list uh, a lot of uh, the components of a graph design project. So there's color, there's the typographic style, and then he chooses just one point, like condensed and center aligned. And then when you pick this one, you get this one here on the bottom. No? And this is just one of the different possibilities that you could get out of it. Here he just did a word mark, but actually uh, he could as well, if he would expand everything to different formats, he could as well do flexible visual identities. Someone else that has been really important uh, to us is Jacques Bertin, that he's a cartographer. But what is really interesting about him is as well the system that he has, the graphic system. This is six elements, and if you count the one in the middle, you have seven elements. He calls them the seven variables. You have uh, size, value, texture, color, orientation, shape, and then you have the position on the two planar dimensions. And then he's doing this with it. He is a cartographer, so he did maps with it, but you could do as well perfectly. You could do a flexible visual identities with it. You see it here, I mean, in this, in this first column, this is uh, the map of France. And it's actually, it's made to, um, to draw maps, but also to draw statistics and diagrams. So the different kinds of elements that you see here, um, they always express a, a certain value. So they're variables for a value that he wanted to express on this card. And He's explaining with this uh, diagram then the, um, well, the different valves that he's using and how he's applying them. In the first row, you have shape. In the second, orientation. In the third, color. Fourth, you have texture. In the fifth, you have value. And then at the end, you have size. And with this, he's drawing the different kinds of maps. Then you see here, in this column, you see P for plane. Um, L for, for lines, and then A for area, no? So and that, that was just like the how, this is how far we came in our daily business, because it's really hard sometimes to take off time um, to research as well while you're working, because the, the client is demanding something, the technology is demanding something, the, the market is demanding something, so you really have to uh, force yourself as well to take time to learn each day more, take your time for it, which nobody pays. So there came a certain point that I started a PhD about this subject. It took me actually 10 years to do this PhD, a bit more than normally. Uh, usually it's like six years, but it took me a bit longer because, yeah, well, we opened two points, we had two kids, this all played a role. Um, but we were really unsatisfied with the way of analyzing flexible visual identities, but we also were really unsatisfied in the way how we were teaching flexible visual identities. And we, we thought we needed a system also for our studio, how to develop these systems. So I started then to uh, take different authors like Jacques Bertin, but also Wusius Wong, Christian Le Borg, Irene Van Ness, uh, Robert Klanten, Mika Mischler, Boris Bumjak, Donis Adonis, so a lot of different kinds of authors that all propose different kinds of models, how to organize the elements uh, that you can use in design with their different hierarchies. And then something like this came out. There was a more complex uh, diagram even, which was impossible to understand and impossible to teach with and uh, impossible to develop uh, flexible visual identities out of it. Because what I was doing here is actually synthesizing everything, all the information we got, 
and I was drawing a map of graphic design in the same scale as graphic design, which is a duplication of graphic design, but another helpful synthesis of what uh, flexible visual identities are. So I boiled it all down to actually just this. Um, well, a little more, but it's actually just this. What we found out through the research and uh, analyzing different flexible visual identities, that it's actually just either form or uh, forms and transformation. Or if you formulate it differently, visual elements and their properties. So you have a square which is uh, yellow and a triangle which is red. And you have visual elements and the transformation. In this category, the recognition of the brand comes through the elements or the color no? of the properties. But in this one, which is uh, describing the transformation, it's coming from a certain process. So you can also establish recognition in doing everything in the same way all the time. So if you're, for example, uh, drawing always with the same kind of pen, um, or photocopying with the same photocopy machine or with a Rezo printer. It doesn't matter what you print or write or copy. It's going to have always this texture no, of the tool that you're using. And it doesn't matter what kind of element it is. You will recognize it through its transformation. And this can be both stat static or flexible. You can have like lots of different kinds of elements or you can always and all lots of different kinds of transformations or processes, or you could always, always have the same, which would be static then. Then the systems can be open or closed. A lot of generative identities, they have open systems, which means that their source is coming from outside of the system. You get from somewhere data, and uh, you use your system to convert this into something visible. A closed system is totally autark. It does not get any influence from outside. And then you have the application, which can be static and flexible as well. Like, imagine you made the fantastic flexible visual identities, but then you don't have the budget to print more than one poster, and th then this identity is not flexible anymore. Or uh, this uh, Peter van Blockland in The Hague, they always, he always had this example. If you make a, a flexible visual identity, and you print 10 different kinds of uh, letterheads, but the secretary don't like only likes one, and he always uses one, then it's going to be a static application, and it's going to be not flexible anymore. Last but last least is uh, visibility. It's like if you don't have the budget, then if you just see one version, then the identity is not flexible anymore. Maybe the system was, but then what at the end you see in the street is not flexible anymore. Yeah, and that's the different types if you, that you have if you're using this really simple model, which is expandable as well. So now I'm going to show you some projects that we did to explain you as well the, the systems. So this would be like an example for type 1, closed visual system, based on elements and their properties. We got this job to redesign the visual identity for industrial design awards in Spain, and they exist since the 70s. It's a really old one. And in Spain, they have a thing that's called Premio Nacional de Diseño, which is like the Nobel Prize for design. And one of these design giants, he did the first logo. Um, so you see, this is this, this triangle, this, uh, no, this, this sign. And um, the prizes, they're called, the first prize, the first awards, they were called Delta. And here you see the evolution of these different prizes. And at the end, they kept on using this triangle you know, with a rooftop and um, sometimes convert them to a triangle. And then you had here this hexagon and here is the new one. What you see here in this column is what, what we then proposed, which is part of the evolution. But one important fact is that you see that in our triangle we cut it actually, the, the upper corner. And this was a huge deal. It took like one month uh, discussions, internal discussions, if they can change the logo of this super famous designer. But the, well, our argument was that actually what he did there and sold them as a delta sign is actually no delta sign. It's a combination out of the 
uh, uppercase delta sign and the lowercase delta sign, but it actually doesn't exist. It's not a real delta sign. So what we did is we did an uppercase uh, delta sign, which had more logic to it, and this was okay then for them. It's not just this. What we did is we actually did a typeface, and we used then the symbol for each of the three different prices to make the typeface legible. It's actually just lines, but without the symbols, they are not legible. And if you want to make advertisement for delta only, then you use only the delta sign. If you want to make advertisement for the other category, then you just use the other element. If you want to make advertisement for all of them, then you just mix them up. And that's the, the whole system. So it's just like different colors and different elements, and they can be combined in every different way. And typography in itself is like the most flexible visual language. You can write anything with it. You can write short sentences or just words, or write long tests, uh, text with it. This is the um, base for our idea, the Paul Renner version, the first version of the Futura, because it's really interesting, the story about Futura. Uh, we made a book about it, but I'm not going to go too much into detail, but it's, it's like considered to be a very German typeface, but in Spain it's considered to be a very Spanish typeface. And that's because the type foundry, um, they moved from Frankfurt, uh, they moved from Frankfurt to Barcelona. And um, if you walk around in Barcelona and you check out all these old bars, you see that they all use Futura. And all the old letterheads, they all use Futura. It's, uh, it's really weird. You see more Futura there uh, than you see here in, in Germany. So we took this from Paul Renner and then we... Uh, we kept on experimenting with this typeface and, and uh, tried out different kinds of versions, but also took like really characteristic, no, that's to totally Paul Renner here, what we did. I mean, we, we centered it more and everything, but this is really recognizable as the Paul Renner version. And then we did the whole alphabet for it so they could write things. And that's the, the posters that we did in 2016 because we wanted to keep them as clients, we also proposed already for 2018 <laughs> posters, uh, 2020, so they were thinking, ah, oh, come on, they're already done, let's, let's give them another job. And actually, we are doing this year, we're doing the new version of, the, of this identity. We just changed the color, and the rest is all the same. <laughs> okay, Verano Archivo, that's uh, in Mexico City, a project that we did in Mexico City an example for type 4 open visual system based on elements and their properties. So we, in this case, we, well, the, um, it's a beautiful place, Archivo. I mean, if you're, I haven't been there because we did not have the budget. And me personally, on my bank account, I don't have the budget to fly there. But in case one of you have the budget, you should really visit this place, this Archivo. It's a beautiful garden. Later, I'm going to show a picture of it. And it's a really small uh, white house, really an interesting architecture. And it, they did something about um, the Mexican industrial <coughs> design, but not the finished objects, just the process, which is really interesting because you see all the mistakes and all the errors and um, the materials that they work with. So the stuff that they had there was already so visually appealing and interesting that we thought that we have to make it visual, and we could not be, as designers, just the surface that covers it all up, no? because the, the content is so interesting. So what we did is we draw, drew a typeface, and uh, we used this as a mask to put these images inside of these interesting objects. So here again, the, um, the, um, the elements are the same, but it's an open system because the images, they can put these images inside. It's they can do whatever they want with it. And in the exhibition, we, uh, well, we didn't want to use a print on the wall, so what we did is we had a huge mirror, and we just used vinyl then to put the shapes of the letters on top. So the filling is not an image, but is the people actually themselves that walk through this exhibition. This is also called the selfie wall, because people nowadays, they're not interested in exhibitions anymore, or the objects that they show, they're just interested for the mirrors, 
so they can take a picture of themselves and say that they have been ex at the exhibition. And for the opening, they did this huge table with a lot of food, and you can see some elements in the, um, in the background. And what's really funny is that this they posted somewhere, and then someone in England made a graffiti of it, but exactly the same. And we don't know that they don't know him, and we don't know him, and uh, they just liked it, and then they just copied it. Okay, that's the tunnel to the garden as well, and then this is the garden. Okay, Tiger, the inner game of design. This is what is this is called. It's a design event that we are organizing in in Hamburg, much smaller than this. Um, it's, I wish we would be as big one day as, uh, as this. But for now and then we invite designers, um, friends, interesting people, different kinds of people. We invited Mr. Dean, who is also called uh, Albert Jan Pohl, is the guy that drew the F15. And um, we had to make a poster for this exhibition. Or maybe that's already actually the reason why we do this event, not because we like to listen to them, but we like to design the poster for the event. And uh, that's an example for a closed visual system based on elements, their properties, and the transformation. Okay, another huge source from, for us, Gerrit Nordsei. Uh, we studied in The Hague, and he has been a huge influence for the Royal Academy. Maybe not now, not uh, as much as before, but he really had a huge impact on all type designers that are coming out of the Royal Academy. And he invented this thing, which is called the typographic universe. Don't know if you heard about this typographic universe. It's actually pretty easy explained. And it's also, I think it became as well um, uh, now more known than before because of the varial fonts. But actually, the way how type designers from the HEC C uh, typefaces are as um, the extremes in between um, low and high contrast. No? It's, for example, uh, for them, they wouldn't say to Helvetica that's a, that's a sun serif. They would say that this is a, a low contrast typeface. If it has serifs or doesn't, that's actually doesn't matter. It's, uh, it's a low contrast typeface. And Budoni is a high contrast typeface. And then you have the difference. And, um, in between the, um, um, the pointed pen, no, the um, Spitzfeder, um, nip yeah, and the broad nib pen, no, which is the Breitfeder. Um, and with these four extremes, you can draw all the typefaces in the world, except constructed typefaces. But it, because they understand type design as a discipline coming from calligraphy, um, this makes total sense. So we took all this knowledge and totally ignored it. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a constructed typeface that we did. But the, well, I mean, the idea behind is similar. What we were interested in is also the, the extremes in between um, two different versions. So what you see here is both on both sides the same typeface, but uh, we have three different kinds of elements. We have round forms. Uh, quarter circles, and we have straight lines, short ones, and long ones. And we can make them thick or thin. In between this, you get these different kinds of versions. And then we met Lo Iacono, uh, with whom we are always uh, working together when we're doing these posters. And he said, OK, I'm, I'm a motion designer. Motion designer. Let, let me do something with it. And then he made it made a moving poster out of it. So this is actually what is happening there. It's like the, the morphing in between this kind of, this extremes that we, that we gave him here. That's the rest of the lecture is just looking at this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, but this actually, here's now something, we also sometimes, we are, our own inspiration. And the idea for the typeface came from a project that we did for the MIT, for the architecture department. Well, they, they wanted us to design posters, lots of different posters for their events. They always have lectures in autumn, in, in fall, and in spring. And uh, then they have like one big poster that they print, and then lots of small ones. So we thought it makes sense to make a system, so it's quicker for us to design these posters. 
Um, the idea that we had for the system was to draw a typeface. You know it already. I mean, you have seen it before. And then to take these different kinds of elements as variables and then exchange the variables, you know, however you want. So you can have, like, uh, you could substitute then this line for these lines or this line for this line, but it's also, it's open, it could be anything. In the first row you see the typeface, and the second one you see the different kinds of elements that we use to construct this typeface. In the third you see a version with different kinds of thicknesses of lines. And the last one, well, that's actually not a bone, it looks like a bone, I know. I sh we should have taken a better image. It's, it's a building from this uh, Trey Chahan. Um, who's an architect, and we designed posters with it. And then we met Chabi Vila, or, you know, well, we know him, we knew him before. We always like to keep in contact uh, with people that know different things than us, uh, and so we can work together and learn new things, both of us from different ends. And he said, well, it's, it's really easy to make out of this a, a typeface, a program, you know? So you just have to upload an image automatically it's getting substituted this line, and then you type with it. So people actually at the MIT, uh, they can do their own posters, and you don't have to waste your time for this really small budget that they have. Uh, a huge name, but really small budget. I mean, really small. We, uh, we were never there. I mean, it's another. We always, I mean, our work travels so much, but we don't at all. I mean, we just stay in Hamburg all the time. Uh, well, not today. Um, yeah, and that's the different things that, but this is already like, this is dynamic. I mean, this, he, this you can type. Well, this is the um, uh, last project I'm going to show. Uh, it's something that you can't see anywhere, and we haven't shown anyone except our client, so that's really exclusive here. It's a pity I don't have a sound for this screen, but it's... Um, a visual identity that we did for an exhibition in Barcelona for the CCCB. That's a beautiful exhibition space just in the middle of Barcelona, in the center of Barcelona. And it's about uh, occultism in the fi uh, 50s in art. And the um, exhibition itself has a lot of pieces which would be difficult to show in public. And they make a lot of advertisement. There's going to be for like one month, the whole city covered with banners and posters, and the buses are driving around with our visual identity. And, um, and they, have, uh, they, they thought it's too risky to put their, I don't know, like uh, people slaughtering, I don't know, animals as performance art. So they wanted to have something really abstract. And we concentrated, Yum Negra means, uh, in, this is Catalan, means uh, black light, and so we just concentrated on a really abstract version of light, the different shades, no? And we made these elements, and with these elements we drew type again. We always draw, draw type. Uh, I don't. Well, it's fun to draw type. I don't. <laughs> I don't have to explain you why we do it. You're not my client. Uh, <laughs> We just like to do it, and that's why we do it. And, well, but then what we do is, well, we test as well all our systems. We see that if they can work on different formats, if we can do different things with it, like not just uh, typography on different kinds of formats, but as well if we can do like frames with it, and then I can put pictures inside, all this flower on the top. So we do this kind of tests, and then at the end, we edit this this kind of fading because they said as well it has to have something a bit more crazy in it because all made as well in the, under the influence of drugs so it had to have some kind of crazy element in it so we added this fading yeah and then you see here like different tests that we made this is actually not the typeface that we're using at the end we used now a uh, different typeface but the designs are more or less what we did as well and this also thinks that they are going to produce this they didn't want to produce. They t say, said it's totally illegible. And I, I, I mean, I agree to a certain point. But I also, I don't think it should be too easy, communication design. Because if you think back to Aldi, I mean, I think also, I think 
I don't know. I mean, when we talk about UX and everything, I think frictionless is not really our thing. I mean, we want to create friction and we want people as well to be a little bit challenged and, and they don't have to understand in the first beginning. I mean, it's, it's a, that's another boundary that we can talk next time about it. Uh, how to make something, to sell something illegible. Huh? So that's the different bags that we did. Notebooks, I mean, it's in the shop, they can, you can buy notebooks then as well. And then we met another great guy, Tim Rodenbrücker, who was, um, wanted to come as well, but he's sick in bed. But he saw this and we were in contact because, uh, ah, because, I don't know, now I have to say it because I started. Uh, there's a book about uh, Herbert Kapitsky, it's a German designer. Uh, from Berlin. He died already in the 80s. Uh, he was, I think, strongly inspired as well by Karl Gerstner, but um, he made a lot of experiments as well with flexible visual systems in the, in the 70s and 80s, and um, well, he had a digital version of a book that I, was re I want, really wanted to read, and, but it's not available anymore. So we came in contact through this, and then we say, yeah, we have to do something together because he knows how to do this stuff with processing and uh, we don't. We tried many times, but our brains are just not able to do it. So he did this pretty quickly, actually. So it's just an interactive tool that you can use then to make these designs. Uh, you can change the grid, you can add columns or make less columns. You can choose the different kinds of elements by clicking on it. And uh, then you can save a PDF or a PNG. This thing is so easy, but also so powerful. It's my, my kids were playing with it. They're 8 and 11, and they were playing for an entire hour. I mean, it's uh, like they were really hooked by this, by this thing. And uh, after I saw this, I, I, I know that the robots won't steal our jobs. It's going to be our kids that are going to steal our jobs. So they loved it. So uh, he was doing building this. And now uh, we got a little bit more budget from the client. And uh, he can, we can make an interactive app with it and, um, and publish this as well. And that's the version then with color which he said was really actually uh, tough because he said it's not really natural for, for processing to align a gradient around a curve. But this is also more or less the tool that we're going to publish then online. And then that's, and that's the last uh, bit of my uh, lecture. He also did an um, animation then, which is going to be shown on a screen outside of the exhibition. Thanks. That's it.